Uh, good afternoon, Ian, and welcome to TFT 13. Great, thanks, Kirsty. It's great to be here. No, we've uh, we've had a we've had four four sessions so far. You're our you're my you're my fifth hour of sitting at the screen listening to presentations. I've I've been learning a lot over the last four hours, and I expect to learn more with yours. Um, so you just want to tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Sure. So um, currently I'm the IT service uh, team leader, IT service manager team leader at a company called Suncorp. Um, and I've been in the IT service management game for about uh, close to 15 years now in various companies in Australia. Um, and uh, really today is uh, a presentation about um, a journey my team has gone on for the last uh, 18, 24 months uh, in regards to service management transformation uh, in particular in a type of uh, methodology we've used to, to move ourselves forward. So I, I, I put this uh, presentation together for the ITSMF conference in Australia in 2011 because I, I thought it was an interesting journey to share with my, with my peers uh, in regards to transformational change and organisational cultural change, um, it, it just even at the team level. Um, so I was really keen to just share that story and hopefully others can come learn from my experiences. Excellent, because yeah, and it's always good to get those those real life stories from the trenches rather than a lot of theory. So it's uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to listening to this. So I will uh, hand control over to you and go and hide myself and mute myself while we while we listen to your presentation. And I'll be back online at the end to have a chat with you and uh, pose any questions that come from the Twitter stream. So remember, everybody who's listening, if you have any questions for Ian, please. Post them on Twitter to at, using the hashtag TFT13. I'll pick them up and and pose those to, to Ian at the end of the presentation. Great. All yours, Ian. Great. Thanks, Kirsty. Great. Okay. I'll kick this off then. So as I said before, hi folks, uh, my name is Ian Jones. I'm the team leader for uh, IT service management in Suncorp. And uh, today it's really a, a case study on um, how I've uh, led a team of IT service management practitioners for a journey for the last 18, 24 months um, in, in to improve IT service management in Suncorp by using Agile, which is a, a software development methodology. So um, I'm just going to step through that today and uh, share some examples of the, the journey we've been on. Um, and this award um, was the basis for our team to win the Innovation of the Year Award uh, in 2011 at the ITSMF Australia Conference, uh, which is a great achievement for the team. So today what I want to do is, is really just step you through a, a brief overview of um, Agile's Scrum methodology in particular. Agile is, is a huge um, approach to software development and you can literally spend weeks on, on this subject uh, but really I just want to focus on one practice today and that's that's Scrum. Um, I'm going to give you a case study of how we've used it to uh, for IT service management and for IT operations. Uh, I'm going to hopefully show to you today um, how Agile enhances your teamwork, um, your collaboration and also is, is a great mechanism for continuous improvement. So. We, we all know that uh, books like ITIL and, and the Deming Cycle uh, give a good um, understanding what, or give us good practice about con continuous improvement. And what we found with Scrum is that it gave us that extra mechanism to make it all happen. And I hope you'll see that in today's presentation. Uh, and finally, at the end, uh, I'll give you some reference material that I found useful uh, for re research. And uh, by all means, I recommend having a look at that after today's presentation. Okay, first thing I'd just like to start off with is just a bit of a disclaimer. Um, I'm not going to talk about how you can use Agile with your change management or release management practices. Um, that's not what today is about. Today is more about um, you've got a team of IT service management practitioners um, and how you can use a, a new way of working. Um, so I just want to make, make sure we're, we're all clear on the expectation there. Uh, I'm certainly hopefully not to cover any other material that people will be covering today. Okay, so to give you some sort of background of the journey we've been on, I really should touch on uh, Suncorp. Now, uh, Suncorp is um, a top 25 Australian stock exchange company, listed company. Um, we are primarily in the area of insurance. In fact, we're the, the largest general insurance company in Australia. We're the largest non-regional bank in Australia. Um, so for those of you in Australia would know we have four major banks. Uh, Suncorp uh, basically comes in fifth. 
and also we have a, a life insurance company as well. So for those people who are watching this telecast from New Zealand and Australia, you may recognize these brands on screen. And if you do business with any of them, you're actually doing business with Suncorp as a group. Um, the one thing I'd like to highlight to you is our up the top right hand corner there, the one company, many brands logo. Um, that's a, a key strategy uh, for Suncorp is to gain scale uh, of our different uh, products and services and technologies to drive efficiencies for each division. Um, so that was a, a key catalyst for our team and moving forward about simplification uh, and bringing services together. We have about uh, 16,000 uh, employees in Suncorp. Um, and of those staff, um, the business technology or IT staff are uh, found in Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne, Australia and also in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, the IT service management team are based in Brisbane. So we have a team of 12 and our role is to coordinate the incident, critical incident, problem, change and configuration management services across the group. Uh, and really, uh, when I started with uh, Suncorp in 2011 uh, in the team leadership role there, uh, it became apparent that um, we had some challenges. And um, to, to best describe those challenges uh, and how we move forward was to really describe them from five different perspectives. And really, the first one I want to touch on is, is customer service. Um, the team, well, we didn't really have any consistent way of one, measuring customer satisfaction, um, and, and in two, then how to act on those on that feedback and, and make it a better service. So um, the team found themselves in a bit of trouble about how we can um, take our customer feedback and move forward and, and improve services. Um, a lot of our customers, particularly in business technology area, saw us more as governance or process cops rather than actually enable enablers of technology or services. Uh, another key uh, problem uh, for the team was um, we really didn't have a business strategy or service improvement plan for IT service management. So certainly the, the department and the division had business plans and strategic plans, but my team didn't really understand how they could fit in with those plans and certainly didn't have one themselves. Um, so it was interesting to find out while the team worked in a building with hundreds of other IT staff, um, they actually felt quite alone. It's um, not surprising then that um, when, uh, as work progressed, with the absence of a business plan, that the team, they didn't have any performance agreements or development plans. And so they were actually, they felt a bit confused, a bit lost uh, about where they fitted in the organization and where they should go next. Um, so this gave them a, uh, a difficult working environment to be in and understand how they can move forward. Unfortunately, due to, due to that sort of environment, they actually um, found themselves working in silos. So while we all understand that services like incident management, problem management, change and configuration management all work together and they have interfaces and, and information flows between those processes and services to provide an overall service management model, um, the team actually didn't communicate that well amongst themselves and didn't understand those interfaces. Uh, so it was not surprising that a number of team members, they would rather communicate by email rather than getting up and meeting face to face with other team members or even their customers. And uh, the fifth challenge for the team was really around the technology. Um, over the time, the, the IT service management tool that we had um, wasn't really governed. There wasn't strict change controls on it. So as time went by, um, the, the level of customizations uh, that were made to the tool grew out of control um, to the point where uh, we couldn't safely upgrade the service management tool. Um, so that was running a risk for the, for the organization. So we had to do something uh, more drastic in that space to, to help bring the services back online and, and more into customers' expectations. So really um, what I found myself in position of and a team did for this matter too is that we're in a, a difficult situation, um, challenges from five perspectives and we, we really needed something different, something to move, how to move forward on this. And what I've found is even, even with my experience in, in IT service management, I couldn't really find a solution in the ITIL books or service management books. I 
we need to look for something else, something alternative. And from that, um, it's just as luck would have it, uh, Suncorp, uh, the the Suncorp Business Services Group, um, they had already embarked on a journey at looking at Agile as a way of delivering IT services. So while Agile is predominantly uh, picked up and adopted by application development teams, uh, Suncorp had made the decision to actually look at Agile as a way of delivering services from end to end, uh, including um, not only the application development teams, but also IT infrastructure. So it was a more holistic view. So that to me was uh, quite attractive. Um, it had a, uh, quite a number of attributes and aspects uh, to the way of working which the team needed. So we started on a journey to explore Agile and to see how we could use it uh, as a way of working for the team. So what is Agile? Well, as you can see here on screen, there's a definition um, that's, uh, that can be freely found on most books. Um, it's really is, is a group of software development methodologies and the keywords are in orange here. It's based on iterative and incremental development where the requirements and solutions evolve through collaboration between self-organizing and cross-functional teams. Now I've made a point of highlighting the, the orange text here because those were the areas where I think the team needed to move forward next. Like these are our weaknesses. Um, so looking at this practice, it looks like it did offer a solution for this, for us and so we were keen to move forward on it. So Agile, we're all familiar with the waterfall model, but how does it relate to the, to the waterfall model as a, as a way of working? So we need to start with looking at the waterfall model uh, and here's a diagram of that on screen here. So typically in a waterfall model project, um, we would specify the requirements, we would sit down with the customer, detail what those requirements are, um, and, and everything seems to happen, or most of the work seems to happen at the beginning of a project. And so we document those specifications, whether they be uh, fun functional or non-functional, um, and we'd get the customer to sign off on what they wanted before we move to the next stage, which is the build. Um, obviously build the solution, test, and then deploy in production. Um, the interesting thing about the, the waterfall model is um, really uh, if when we get to this test stage uh, and we find that there's issues, uh, we either have to go back to maybe the specify stage because we've inappropriately documented or understood a specification or if it's, actual, it's a bug, uh, we might go back to the build stage and there's some work that needs to be done, some remediation work or rework that needs to be done. Um, so the interesting thing about the waterfall model is that um, if you look at the far right hand side of this model, the value of the solution for the customer isn't really delivered until right at the end. And I'm sure we've been, uh, been, uh, been on or even been a part of or, or been aware of lengthy waterfall projects uh, where specifications are sometimes taking 12 to 18 months before the actual solution is handed over to the customer. Agile has a, a proposes a slightly different approach. Um, what it proposes is that you take these same specifications or requirements uh, from the customers uh, and you break them up into much smaller releases and your goal is to re re release a working product with minimal functionality or just enough functionality for the customers to get value and then incrementally roll out extra features as time goes by. So as I show here in the diagram, you would take your highest priority or most important features first, take that small batch, go through the same process of build, test and deploy and then roll to production and then get that customer feedback early in the product life cycle. And then that would then feed into the next set of important features. What's the, what's the next set of priority features we want to roll out? And so what, you do, what you're eventually doing, uh, fundamentally doing is you're still taking a, a large model, a, a large set of requirements, but you're breaking them down into small releases and pushing them into production slowly, but sh oh, not slowly, but incrementally. And I'm going to show you later on uh, how, um, how that's helped uh, in regards to uh, improving our services for IT service management in Suncorp. What I'm also going to do later on is I'm going to come back to this model I want to show you what actually happened for Suncorp when we upgraded our IT service management tool and we decided to adopt an agile approach for that project. 
So moving on to Agile again, the definition of it. Um, Agile is basically three core parts. It has a, a manifesto and values. Um, the, it has uh, 12 principles, which I won't be covering off today. Uh, it has a series of practices and tools and techniques. And uh, one of them I'll be covering off for the rest of the presentation. Um, I'm going to touch on the uh, the values in a minute, but I suppose with the manifesto, it's quite easy to find. If you just do a Google on Agile manifesto, you'll certainly find that it has its own dedicated website. So in regards to the Agile values, um, there's four key values. And I'm just going to give you a second to, to read the text on screen here. And I'm just going to touch on the first one, where the statement says, individuals and in interactions over processes and tools. You'll notice in these four statements, I've actually highlighted the word over in orange. And the reason for that is I want to highlight the point that with Agile, they value the statements on the left-hand side more than the statements on the right-hand side. I want to make sure it's clear and people understand this, this, this important point that the left-hand side does not supersede the right-hand side. We just value it more, and I'm giving this uh, example because I'm giving highlighting this point because when I first started uh, in Suncorp, uh, I do recall a conversation with an application developer who claimed that they didn't or he didn't need to do uh, change requests because they did Agile, and and actually that's not true. Um, when you look at the Agile values, um, it's a case of we value working software over comprehensive documentation. That doesn't mean we don't do the documentation. So it's a really important point for people to understand this because I, I find that, uh, or I have found that Agile being a framework uh, is similar to ITIL and that is it can be very easily misinterpreted. So one of the key points, um, uh, key instruments uh, in Agile that I found very useful uh, for the team and moving forward with the IT service management team was the concept of a social contract. Now, a social contract is, is very similar to a, a project charter. Um, it's, it's specifically for the team, and it's a set of rules that the team agrees to. It is to go above and beyond, and probably to be more detailed than your organizational values, per se. So it's an opportunity for the team to get together and document, well, we have our roles and responsibilities, but what should we be doing beyond that? and particularly how should we interact with each other. So it's a really good focus point for teams to say, well, as a team, this is how we are going to work together. The great thing about a social contract is that it, it can differ from team to teams, even project to project. So team members need to be aware that if they're working with multiple agile teams, um, as they switch between teams, um, they need to be aware of the social contract they're uh, entering into. So some of the statements you might find uh, in a social contract, here's just some examples here that I've come across in my experience. Um, and I'll just give you a minute to uh, just to read those. So as you can see there, they're, they're not they're not supposed to be large for large organizations. It's, it's really for team based, how a team will interact and behave uh, with each other. And it's often a good practice too, um, maybe once a month, uh, maybe once a quarter for the team to come back together and refresh their social contract, at least do a review of it to make sure that it, uh, it, it's still in tune with the times. So one of the key practices I wanted to talk about today was the, the Scrum framework. And, and this is uh, really a way of working. And even though it was uh, written in the first instance uh, for application development teams, um, as I said previously, we actually adopted this in Suncorp as a, a way of working for all IT teams. So we have application development teams as well as IT infrastructure teams using this approach. Um, so it, it's quite uh, quite an interesting environment to, to work in. So I'm going to step through this slide in pieces and break it down for you so you can understand the flow more. So please don't feel like you need to study this diagram to detail right now. So the first part is the product backlog. 
And um, we start with the product backlog because this is our uh, list of uh, features or uh, requirements that our customers want of us. So if we're looking at this diagram here, you can see that inputs come from com executives, customers, stakeholders, and come to the product owner. The role of the product owner is to vet uh, those features to understand the priorities uh, and then rank them in the product backlog. So to give you a more practical example, uh, I could have the network team leader come to me and say, uh, look, we need some new incident templates in, in the service management tool so the service desk can more consistently uh, create incidents and assign them to my queen team quickly. So any one of my team members could take that requirement. Um, we would, I, I, as the product owner or the service owner for incident management, would review that and then give that a priority and put it into the product backlog. So it's much like a, a list of work that needs to be done. So with the regards to features and stories, well, I've, I've been using the words requirements and features uh, up to during this presentation, but I'll just break it down in it with Agile, uh, well, our adoption of Agile, I should say. Uh, we use two types of jobs, if you will. Um, one is a feature. A feature is one or more stories, so it's a larger chunk of work. And a story is usually the smallest unit of work, so it's like a task. So some work you might receive is a single unit of work, quite a simple story. Others, uh, a feature could go on for multiple weeks. So you'd want to break that down into numerous stories. Um, out my team, uh, we tend to have two types of uh, features or stories that come to us. Uh, there's planned work, so things that we know that we can plan in advance and action. So for example, uh, continuous service improvement activities or any business as usual activities. So some examples might be, uh, for example, continuous service improvement might be uh, we have an audit finding on one of our services um, to the recommendation we need to action. So we will take that and create a, a feature card for that. Uh, and then if we need to, then break that feature card into stories to understand what we need to do to, to complete or satisfy that audit item. Some BAU activities we might do would include things like running the weekly cab uh, or running, uh, doing uh, some sort of weekly uh, meeting with our customers. We treat that as business as usual. So it's known in advance. Unplanned work is work that we know that we're going to do, but we just don't understand the size and effort it's going to take during the next two weeks to do. So a classic example for us is a major incident that might come in or some problem investigations. So of course, when you've taken these features and put them in your product backlog, one of the things we're going to have to do is, is size them to understand how big the effort's going to be. So there's numbers, numbers of ways you can size a feature or a story. Uh, one of the more traditional methods is by time. Now, I, I can warn you that a lot of agile coaches don't like the concept of time. Um, they prefer the other two scales you see on screen there. Uh, but for my team, when they adjusted from moving from a timesheet sort of work way of working to agile, we felt it was more comfortable for us. So a key point I would like to highlight to you is that the type of sizing method you use is not important. What is important is that your team is comfortable with it and that you continue to use it over a number of iterations or sprints, which I'll talk about soon. Um, so you need a gauge for how much work your team is able to do. So the other two scales you see on the screen there, there's Fibonacci uh, and t-shirt sizes. Uh, now, people often say to me, well, how do we size something like a t-shirt size? How can you say something's a medium or a large? Uh, and, and that's a really interesting question. And again, it's based on your team's perception on how to measure the size of a card. I mean, there's no clear, clear science to this. It's whatever works and is comfortable for your team. So what I'll focus on now on the sizing bit, we'll extend on that concept a little bit further. And I want to talk a bit about um, the sprint. So we've got our cards in our product backlog and now it's time to do a sprint. Now a sprint is a fixed period of time where we will do work. Okay, now the start and end dates of the sprint are fixed. Um, and during the period of time, the team needs to commit to the stories 
that they're going to do in that time period. So I'll give an example. Uh, my team, our sprint runs for 10 working days or two weeks. We will start on a Wednesday morning and we will finish 10 days later on Tuesday close of business. Um, now, what that means is with each sprint, we'll have a set of stories that we need to complete. Um, the team is committing to completing those stories during that two-week period. So what's interesting about Agile is in the Scrum approach is uh, you're not allowed to let quality suffer. Okay, so just because someone's doing Agile, the quality doesn't cannot go down. That's a, that's a furphy. Um, and so what it means is because your period of your work is time boxed, the only thing that's flexible is scope. So in other words, the volume or scope you can do is the only thing that can flex. Okay, so we've got our um, product backlog again. We've got a bunch of cards or stories that we, we need to complete. So what we might do is we'll run a sprint planning meeting to organize what cards are we going to do in the next two weeks. And one of the key ways of uh, sizing those cards and understanding how much work we do is a concept called planning poker. It's a, it's a novel approach, it's great fun. Um, and the way it works is, is each team member gets a card for the sizing. So in this example here, the sizing uh, mechanism we're using is one, two, four, and eight. Now that could be hours, could be days, it could be whatever you want it to be. It could be t-shirt sizes. The key point is, is that these are just um, measures of size of, of something that needs to be done. They're just different scales. So each member of the team, so on screen there you see three members of the team, they will receive one of these, uh, each of these cards. And what happens is each card, high priority card, is presented by the product owner to the team. And story cards are written in a way like a story and they say, as a certain type of role, I need something so that I can achieve a business outcome. So in this example on screen, we have an application support team who needs 10 new requests for change templates in our tool, ITSM tool, so that the team can raise requests for changes consistently for their services. So that card will be presented to the team in a meeting and say, right team, how big do we think this card is? And so each member of the team will then present a card and saying, this is how big we think it is. So what you can see on the screen here as an example is that two of the team members have gone, it's a two pointer and one person says it's a four pointer. What's great about this planning poking technique is that the, the goal of this process is not necessarily to gain consensus. The goal is to really for the team to have a robust discussion about their interpretation of this card and what it means. This is a great opportunity for you to get your team to share their experiences and knowledge about what they would do to in order to achieve this card. And so they share that knowledge and share that uh, share their perspectives. So the great thing about this, this discussion is that they have the opportunity to talk about their interpretations, their assumptions about the, job, the card, and also what they see are the risks of, of, of actually carrying out this work. Now you may find that the, the team may need to go back to the customer and drill into more detail what the card means, but that's okay. It's better to do that early than to commit to a card and find out you can't actually deliver it. So a great opportunity for the team to get together and uh, talk about the card and, and what the story means to them. Okay, so we've done our planning. We've put all our cards in the um, uh, in, a, in the sprint, in the sprint backlog, and then we put them up on the wall. And as you can see on screen here, uh, we have a, what's, what's called a, a story wall. So. Um, the cards are put up on a wall and each day the team gets together and gauges their progress. And the way they do that is, a, is in a, um, a method called the daily stand-up. So each day the team gets together and conducts a 15 minute meeting to explain the progress of the story cards. So as you can see on, um, hopefully on screen here, you'll see that the team members are referring to the cards that they're progressing uh, during a sprint. 
So the great thing about this uh, stand-up, it's a great opportunity to get together and talk about what they're up to and where they're up to with their tasks. And typically, there's three key points that each team member will be talking about during the stand-up. They'll explain what is it they did yesterday, what they plan to do today, and also what blockers are they facing as a team or as individuals. So it's a great opportunity to share where they're at, uh, especially in a small team, they can share knowledge and progress. And they can also share what's stopping them from moving forward. Now, it's really important at this point to highlight that even if a team uh, has a blocker or an individual has a blocker that they can't progress their work, the key thing they need to be careful of is not to use the daily stand-up as a problem-solving meeting. So, for example, the, the gentleman there in a the green shirt, he might identify that he has a blocker. Um, the team shouldn't get trapped into talking about how to solve that issue. What you could do is, is other members of the team or myself as a team leader can go have a chat to that individual after the stand-up, understand what's blocking them and then look for ways to help resolve the issue. So this is a great way for the team just to share knowledge day by day basis. It's only 10, 15 minutes long. And as you can see on the wall there, it's a great way to show progress in a big visual way. I'd just like to take a moment just to highlight uh, the wall there. And if you look on the left-hand side there, you'll see there's some charts next to the story wall. Agile is very big on the concept of what's called big visual charts. So a big visual chart is any important piece of documentation that the team needs to function. And it's usually printed out and it's large and it's next to the story wall because that way the team can see um, see that uh, big visual chart as they're doing their daily stand-up. So in other words, key project or team documentation is visible every day. Earlier in the presentation, I spoke about uh, social contracts. Well, this is a great place to put your social contract. So when you draw up your social contract, uh, please don't file it away in your, on your, in your network folder or on your SharePoint site or whatever. It's a great opportunity to print it out put it up on the wall so the whole team can see it every day. One of the key roles I'd like to highlight with the team is there's a role called the Scrum Master. Now, it's not a, a badge you wear or a hat you wear. It's just a role that one member of the team takes and it's their job to keep the, keep the daily stand-up ticking over and progressing. When you've got a, a team, especially if you've got a team that's more than eight people, you can, you can find your daily stand-up can drag on. Um, and so it's, it's, it's the job of the scrum master to make sure everyone keeps on track and keeps to the point. I'd just like to, um, again, just show how the daily stand-up works again, just with a, from a, a card point of view. So here's an example of a, um, a story wall with three columns, just your, what you need to do um, what's currently in progress and what stories have been done. So if we look at the green cards and let's just say that's the incident management team. The incident management team completes a story card, uh, story number one there. So they have two options at this point. They can uh, maybe perhaps work as together as a team and jointly finish off number two that's already in progress. Um, or if they think that's a one person card and that's tracking along fine, they might decide then to start then story number three, start progressing on that. Whereas another team, say in the yellow cards here, say that's the change management team, um, they might be blocked on story number two there. So again, that should be highlighted to the team at the stand up. And then there's an opportunity then for members of both the change team and even the incident management team there to, to help out and help unblock that card. Sometimes block cards need to be escalated to, to leadership like myself or even higher uh, if it's a really, really uh, tough issue to crack. Now, um, Agile is, is a great way of working. Um, and one of the things we found uh, in Suncorp is that uh, we, we needed to make a small adjustment in not only the way we worked uh, as a team, but also with our tools. Okay, so if your, your tools aren't 
supporting the process, uh, they can actually slow you down. Um, so what was interesting is that in, in Suncorp and probably like a lot of other organizations, uh, we have an IT service management tool um, and we have an application defect or request system. Um, so they're two separate systems, but as you saw before, we use one story wall to control our work. So what we ended up doing at Suncorp was one of our uh, clever uh, IT people put together a, what was called a, a virtual wall or a, a, a system that dynamically read the data from both systems and presented the data for one team in one screen. So in other words, uh, what you see on screen here is the wall for my team, the IT service management team, and it's taking data from our IT service management system and our application defect system and puts it all into one wall. Uh, you'll note there are a number of uh, cards that have been blacked out. That's, that's just, just to provide confidentiality of some of the work we're doing. Uh, but the key thing I wanted to highlight to you in this screen um, was really the fact that um, in order to achieve this way of working, uh, you may need to come up with some innovative solutions in regards to your tool set to help you support your way of working. Now, I spoke before briefly about big visual charts. Um, and they're an important concept in Agile because um, it, it doesn't help anyone if, if the key information that your team needs is locked away in network drives and, and can't be easily accessed. Um, so I spoke before about the social contract and how important that is to have that up next to your story wall so the team can see it every day. But one of the other uh, key big visual charts we use is this one here called the burn down. Now the burn down is simply a way to simply measure your progress. Um, and again, you put it up against your story wall uh, so that all the team and your leadership can see it. And here's how it basically works. If we look at the purple line, which is the projected line, we can see here with nine days left to go in our sprint. So in other words, at the beginning of our 10 day sprint, the team has got 90 points to deliver. Now all this, this graph is simply showing you is a straight line projection uh, of how we're going to complete 90 points through to the end of the sprint. It, it's a simple Excel graph. What we do is each day at the stand up, we discuss how we're progressing uh, and therefore how many points have we actually delivered. Now when I say delivered, I mean stories actually done, something delivered to the customer. Now as cards are done, stories are done, we take those points off the remaining total we have yet to deliver. So what you're seeing here is that in the first couple of days, we've delivered a number of points of cards to our customers. So each day we track this and then we plot this on the graph. So as you can see here, we've started, the team has started well. Our velocity is greater than the projected velocity, which is a good sign. But as you can see here, as we get to day seven, six, it starts to flatten out. Now that could be because we're not delivering as many points as we'd liked. And it could be a number of reasons for that. It could be staff are away. We could have some blockers. We could have customers who are not available to test the solutions we give at them. So there are things that could be stopping us from getting work done. And that will show up on this, on this graph. So that's why this, uh, the burn down chart is, is such a, a vital and, and such a useful tool to use for the team. Because as you plot this, the team can see every day how we're tracking. It's very simple. It's something easy to do every day. And it's something visual. It's also a great discussion point for our leadership team. So at any day, my manager and the manager above them and the manager above them, they can go for a walk around the IT building, have a look at teams' burn down charts and just see how they're progressing. Okay. What are the other uh, key things we do at, towards the end of the sprint? So we, we've done a lot of work, we've delivered um, some points and, and value to our customers in regards to improved services. One of the key um, activities toward you do it towards the end of a sprint is what's called a showcase. Now a showcase is like a, a sprint review. It's, it's a presentation to your key customers or stakeholders or executives uh, about how you performed in the last two weeks, what you've actually delivered. 
So it's an opportunity for you to demonstrate your completed work and solicit feedback from those customers on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So it's a great opportunity to understand are your customers really happy with what they've received? Um, has it been effective for them? Um, and also for them to give you uh, an insight on what they think about your services and also what they think might be coming up next. So it's a, it's a fantastic forum just to solicit that feedback and, and understand where you're heading. Um, what's really important about a showcase is that we shouldn't try and make it uh, like a, a drill session as in um, to really um, drill into the team and, and, and uh, to really um, understand well why didn't things go right and what are, you, what are you doing wrong, that sort of thing. It's really just an opportunity to share how the team progressing and how they're working well with your customers and, and if they're not then what can we do to fix that. Um, it shouldn't be there to judge their achievements, it should be there just to understand their progress and what blockers they could have and, and work with your customers to help unblock them. So for my team um, in IT service management we tend to find we have a, a very large customer base so virtually any one of the hundreds if not thousands of IT staff in Suncorp. So what we tend to do is we tend to give showcases to our key customers, uh, key, uh, key executive level customers. Um, we'll also give showcases to our leadership team uh, so they can understand too how we're progressing. Key thing about showcase too, it shouldn't be too long. Again, 15, 30 minutes. It shouldn't be a long meeting at all. Okay, finally, but certainly not least, is a sprint retrospective. Now, again, this is uh, right towards the end of the sprint. Uh, you've delivered all your work, you've done your showcase with your customers. This is now an opportunity for the team to sit down and have a review of how we went for the last two weeks or how you went during your sprint. So typically, your sprint retrospective is held on the last day of the sprint. It's an opportunity for the team to sit down and just touch on three key points. What went well, what didn't go so well, and what still puzzles me or what still puzzles them. So it's an opportunity not only to discuss the stories or the services they delivered, but also how they worked as a team. So you're actually reflecting on two elements here, the, the deliverables that you're, that you're giving the products and the services you're, you're handing out and improving, but also how you're working as a team. So it's at this part um, of the uh, Scrum process that's really, really useful for continual service improvement. What's really handy about this opportunity is that when you have this meeting and you've documented uh, all your cards about what went well, what didn't go well and what still puzzles you, is that you can then feed those ideas back into your product backlog. So what this means, and as you can see on screen here, is that once you've done your sprint retrospective, you have all those new ideas and improvements, and they go back into your product backlog. So in other words, the features and stories that go into your product backlog aren't always from your customers. They can also come from your team as a way of improving your, improving your general process. So what I hope you can see on the screen here is how easily and effectively the Scrum process helps teams improve the way they work and just continuously improve and, and sharpen the source, as to say, uh, every two weeks. You don't have to make big fundamental improvements to really improve. What Agile has shown, uh, for our team anyway, for the last two years, is that by making small improvements every two weeks will make a vast difference in your services. Okay, so one of the things uh, I wanted to focus on is I, I, I'm, you've heard me now talk quite a bit about continual service improvement and, and how it has actually improved that. Well, I'd like to show you this graph just to highlight uh, the difference it has made. Um, what I'd started doing back in August 2011 was I started mapping the amount of work the team does in regards to continual service improvement in regards to what's called lights on or business as usual work. And what I just want to show here is that if you look at the far left hand side, in the first sprint, the team was doing 
around about 85% of lights on, BAU or business as usual maintenance type work and only 15% of improvement, continuous improvement work. Within three sprints, you can see that we were improving the volume of continuous service improvement work by almost over 50%. So it's a dramatic increase in the, in the amount of time and effort we, we could then dedicate to continuous service improvement by just fine tuning the way we worked. You'll also see on the screen there that, that they then plummeted in sprint four. And so what happens is, uh, to, and this is actually in this sprint, what happened was we had a couple of two key, key members uh, take leave. So when you're short staffed, you still have to do your lights on and, and admin type duties. So not surprisingly, that dominated the type of work we did for that two weeks. But then once they returned, we returned to, if you will, stronger levels of continual service improvement. And that got all the way through to the last column there on the right hand side, where we actually had enough capacity within the team to take on an entire improvement project because we could see that almost 60% of our time was doing continual service improvement. So in other words, we could do our lights on work with only 40% of the team and I could move the other 60% of the team to a new project. Um, I promised before to show you uh, the difference. Uh, well, earlier in the presentation, I spoke about the waterfall model and the agile model, uh, and I also promised to show, well, what happened when we adopted agile as a way of doing our IT service management tool upgrade? Well, what was interesting to note is that, as you can see on screen here, we still have the, the waterfall model there, just as a reference, the big green bar there, value delivered in December. And the blue line is the projected agile approach and, and how you should deliver value. The red dotted line was is actually our experience and what we actually delivered when we upgraded our IT service management tool. So in this particular project, what we were able to achieve was we basically started in December and we actually delivered an upgraded IT service management tool to our customers uh, by end of July. So around seven months, we rolled out a brand new system. Now, what was important to note here is that when we rolled that new system out, it didn't go into production with all the requirements and all the features that our customers wanted. What we chose was a basic core set of services that was simplified and we just had the most important features go in first. And then as we moved on to August in September and October, we incrementally rolled out the next set of features that our customers wanted. So it's not surprising then that what you're seeing on screen here is actually a hybrid model of both the agile technique and the waterfall technique. And the reason for this is, well, the reason was actually well covered in a ITSM uh, podcast uh, by uh, um, I think it was Mark Hooper a few weeks ago. That is, the waterfall model is very good, very handy if you want to do transformational change. Agile is very good if you want to do incremental change. And so when we rolled out this upgraded IT service management system, we actually did a combination of the two. We did the big bang approach with the new system, but then incrementally rolled out the most important features to our customers after that. I just want to take a moment to, to highlight what was really interesting was during the period of October to November with the new system in place was that as our customers learned the new system and gained more experience with the new system, the, some, the majority, uh, I would say about 40% of the requirements that were documented back in May and June were no longer relevant they became redundant because the customers became familiar and learnt how the new system worked. So it's an interesting point uh, about the Agile technique is that it gives you the opportunity to 
really review the value of requirements from customers before they go live and therefore can save you time and money in development costs. Now, of course, it's, I've, I've spoken a, quite a bit today about um, internal process, a way of working and the IT service management tool, but always we should end with the customers because they're the first and foremost. In regards to the new way of working we have using Agile, uh, as you can see on screen here, for three of our services, we've seen a dramatic improvement in the perception of a uh, customer's perception of these services. So as you can see for problem, which is the red line, um, we use the net promoter system as a way of uh, measuring our customer satisfaction. Uh, we were uh, around a negative 25% net promoter score. Uh, and over this period of time, nearly 12 months, we've now gone up to above 50% positive in net promoter score. So this is the, to the evidence that um, our customers are happy more than happy uh, with our services that we've been providing uh, from where we were 12 months ago. So it's, it's, a, it's a, great, uh, a great piece of evidence um, to show that um, improving just the way you're working, especially in a collaborative team-based approach, can make dramatic differences to the services you give to your customers and how your customers can per perceive your services. Uh, finally, um, some future research as I promised. Um, so, so there's a lot of good information on the net about Agile and Scrum. So, but my three favorite uh, takeaways, um, if you go on YouTube, there's a great video called Intro to Scrum in under 10 minutes. Um, there's two versions available. I recommend the old version. I found that pretty simple to follow. The diagram I've been using during this presentation um, is available on the, on the web as well. Just look for agileforall.com. Um, have a look for that uh, link there. And finally, one book that I use and I keep going back to is Succeeding with Agile uh, by Mike Cohen. Um, I found it to be a great book. It's, uh, it's a practitioner's guide on how to implement Agile. Um, it's more of a how to implement Agile in an organization rather than what Agile is. So it's more of a, an intermediate level book. Uh, finally, folks, uh, to wrap things up, um, is my email address and my, I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn and Google+. Uh, so by all means, if you have any questions, uh, I'd like to hang out and uh, have a chat a bit more about this, uh, please don't hesitate to, to give me a call, or send me a tweet, and uh, we'll go from there. That was, a, that was a really, really interesting presentation. It's, um, Len, I've never gone into those techniques in any, in any great um, depth before, so it was, uh, I, I certainly learned a lot. Um, just a couple of quick questions. We haven't got a lot of time, but a couple of questions that have, have come in. Um, mm -hmm. how, how did you how did you learn the Agile and Scrum methods? Did you undertake formal training for, for yourself and your team, or did you learn through forums and, and self self instruction? Yeah, well, we we did have some formal training, but it was it was quite time time box. It was only brief. It was like uh, we spent a day on it. But I must admit, uh, the two key things that helped us get across the line was was a lot of self research and right. uh, research. The other thing is that we were very fortunate to be in an organisation that really supported Agile already, and so it was very easy for us to go walk over to an application development team and just watch them do it. Right. Okay. Yes. So I recommend to yes. Yeah. So I recommend to anyone if you if you do want to learn this, um, just link up with a company or someone that's doing it and just watch what they do. Right, excellent. So, so learning learning by by watching and immersing yourself in it rather than going out and doing that, that formal training is is going to going to help. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Very good. And did you did you have any resistance from from your team when you decided to do things this way? Um, there was a little bit of resistance, and I suppose the most common the most common question that was asked is, well. What's it to do with us? Um, because we're more of an operational team rather than an application development team. So, how is, on earth is this going to work for us? And in particular, a, 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 a struggle for us um, was how to size the cards, especially for unplanned work. Mm -hmm. So, th there is no uh, perfect answer to this. So, again, it was a lot of trial and error, and 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 excuse, excusing the punt, but we incrementally slowly 
uh, involved our agile practices. So we did little bits at a time, um, and really what I'm sh what I showed you today and, and the way we work today has taken us 18 months, two years to get down pat. Yeah, no, no overnight success in anything we do, is there? <laughs> no, that's right. certainly not. No, that's right. Well, I'm afraid we've, we've run out of time. I could actually talk to you on this for, for quite a bit longer. So hopefully we'll, we'll get another, another opportunity in, in another forum at some stage. So uh, thank you very, yeah, very much for your time, Ian. It's been a, a fascinating presentation. Well done. No worries. Thanks very much. And I just want to put in a quick plug. Uh, viewers, don't forget, uh, Dave Hepin is also doing a presentation on uh, Agile and Scrum and Kanban in TFT 13. So please look out for that one. Wonderful. Thanks, Ian. We'll talk to you again soon. All right, Kirstie. All the best. Bye. Introducing My IT from BMC Software. One quick download, and the way your users think about IT changes forever. Let's say they need a networked printer, or a Wi-Fi connection, or even a map of an office they're visiting. My IT already knows where they are and shows them a list of available resources and services pre-configured for their devices. Or maybe your user needs help with something more complex. With My IT, they can do most things themselves. But if they can't, they can simply schedule an appointment with a technician who can. In short, My IT is built to make your IT organization more modern and your users infinitely happier, dramatically changing the perception of your services.